The next type of reaction we're going to talk about in chapter 16 uh, involves the formation of acetals. So aldehydes and ketones react with alcohols in a manner very similar to that of water uh, when they are in basic conditions. So if we recall uh, from the previous sections when we talked about how to form hydrates, we saw that in basic conditions hydroxide will attack a carbonyl and displace that carbon-oxygen double bond. And the result is now you've created this carbon-oxygen, um, a new carbon-oxygen bond, and the pi bond of the carbonyl has broken. The electrons go to the, ox the um, oxygen on the right, and you form an alkoxide. And so this alkoxide in water can be protonated, and it results in a geminal diol, or a hydrate. So similarly, when we think about alcohols, alcohols are organic derivatives of water. Um, and so it makes sense that in basic conditions, um, an alcohol can be deprotonated and you produce alkoxide ions. And so these alkoxide ions can behave very similar to hydroxide, uh, where they attack the carbonyl carbon, displace the carbon-oxygen bond, uh, again, you form a new alkoxide. This time, you have created a new carbon-oxygen um, sigma bond, uh, but the oxygen has some alkyl group attached to it instead of a hydrogen attached to it. And this can then be um, protonated by the alcohol instead of water. It's, it can be protonated by the alcohol, and the result is this structure right here where so instead of having two OH groups attached to the carbon you have an OH and an OR attached to the carbon so you're forming an, an ether um, functional group and an alcohol functional group on the same carbon. Notice we regenerate our alkoxide as well. Now when the alcohol and an alkoxide are on the same carbon this type of functional group is called a hemiacetal. So, like hydration, most hemiacetals are actually hard to isolate due to um, equilibria. Uh, recall we talked about equilibrium of hydration products, and we saw that that equilibrium um, is largely influenced by the uh, substituents on the carbon. So, too, is it with hemiacetals, and so they tend to, um, once you try to isolate them, they, try, they, they tend to revert back to the carbonyl and the alcohols. Uh, there is an exception, and you see that comma, so something else is coming up, and that exception is cyclic hemiacetals. Now, how do cyclic hemiacetals form? Well, if you think about it, whenever you have an aldehyde or a ketone, and on the same molecule, there is an alcohol present, you can undergo an intramolecular cyclization or an intramolecular uh, hemiacetal formation. Uh, this can be done in pretty much any solvent, but uh, it can be done even in water, right? When you essentially dissolve the um, aldehyde, at the um, the molecule that contains an alde aldehyde and an alcohol um, in water, the alcohol will attack the aldehyde and form a ring structure. And so depending on how many carbons that is, you see that it cyclizes and forms a hemiacetal, where you have a COH and a COR attached on the same carbon. And you see this a lot in nature. Um, sugars actually do this. Sugars are carbohydrates that contain um, carbonyls. They also t contain a lot of alcohol functional groups. And those alcohols will react with the carbonyl in aqueous um, solutions and they will cyclize on themselves. And these are called cyclic hemiacetals. So let's look at an example. Here I have uh, an aldehyde and then on the one, two, three, fourth carbon, um, at the end of the chain, I have an alcohol coming off of it. So when it places in water, 
you essentially get um, free rotation about the molecule, that alcohol can attack the carbonyl and you form a ring. And in this particular case, it's a five-membered ring, right? Because you have four carbons plus the oxygen. And so you form this ether linkage uh, that contains a five-membered ring. And because of that you know, five-membered ring, we see that five- and six-membered rings are fairly easy to form intramolecularly. And, and so it encourages the reaction to take place. And of course, I can do this um, extending the chain by one carbon. So now I have five carbons. I have an alcohol at the end. I have an aldehyde. I dissolve this in water, and it's going to cyclize to give me this particular hemiacetal. Again, recognize what a hemiacetal is. That carbon has an ether linkage, and it has an OH linkage to it. Right? So whenever you see a carbon that has an ether and an OH that is called a hemiacetal. And hemiacetals are reversible, so you can get back the um, aldehyde and the alcohol. Now, in acidic conditions, we talked about basic conditions, but in acidic conditions, <coughs> nucleophilic addition doesn't stop at the hemiacetal. It goes one step further. So let's take a look at um, the mechanism of this reaction. In acidic conditions, now if, if, we're, um, if we're introducing the carbonyl to alcohol in acidic conditions, we don't have alcohol. We have, well, we do have alcohol present, um, but we also have the alkyl oxonium ion, H2OR+. And that alkyl oxonium ion now is an electrophile. So the carbonyl is behaving like a nucleophile. We see that the oxygen lone pair of electrons are going to get protonated right, from the um, acid, the uh, alkyl oxonium ion. And you generate this, right, where the oxygen now has a positive charge. But we know that there's resonance uh, where the carbon can that the pi electrons basically can be donated onto the oxygen. The carbon is the electrophile, right? So now I have an alcohol plus our protonated carbonyl. That alcohol will attack the carbonyl carbon, displacing the carbon-oxygen double bond. The result is um, this species, right? So notice we're very close to what looks like a hemiacetal. The carbon has an OH and it has an OR, but the OR is protonated. And so we can simply um, remove that proton, uh, and we can do that with uh, an alcohol, right? So we're removing the proton, and we're generating the hemiacetal. Notice we're also regenerating... Um, the alkyl oxonium ion in the process. And this is important, right? We get our hemiacetal uh, and we're regenerating the acid. And in acidic conditions, um, that OH group can be protonated. And this is the key, right? Because uh, if it gets protonated, you see that now I have water and that water can easily come off. So I've created a good leaving group um, and so water comes off. When water comes off, I generate a carbocation, and this carbocation can be stabilized through resonance. I can donate a pair of electrons from the oxygen into the um, carbon, and I generate a new resonance structure, right, where the positive charge is on the oxygen. And uh, we see that this is the major resonance contributor uh, between those two resonance structures. Now, Again, you see that there's similarities between this structure and that of a protonated carbonyl. And what happens? Well, an alcohol can um, behave as a nucleophile. So we've increased the electrophilicity of that carbonyl. Um, and so an alcohol can then attack the carbon, displace that carbon-oxygen bond. Now the oxygen is neutral. Uh, but um, the oxygen on the right has a positive charge. Um, all we have to do now is deprotonate that oxygen, and we can do so with another uh, um, uh, alcohol molecule, 
and the result is this. So instead of having an OH and an OR, we have two ether functional groups on the, uh, on the geminal carbon, so on the same carbon, we're generating two um, ether functional groups. This is called an acetal. So uh, acetals are very prevalent in both nature and in organic synthesis. So you have to be able uh, to recognize acetals. You have to be able to recognize hemiacetals as well. And the reason for this is, we're going to find out later, uh, is that uh, they can be used um, in terms of organic synthesis as um, uh, as protecting groups of carbonyls. Think about what we've generated here. We've generated two um, ether functional groups. And ether functional groups are fairly stable, especially in basic conditions. So carbonyl is unstable in basic conditions. It normally, um, the whatever the base is, is going to attack the carbonyl. Um, but we can convert it to an acetal. And the cool thing is the acetals are reversible. In acidic conditions, they are reversible. So the one thing that, that we have to be able to do is we have to be able to recognize acetals and we have to be able to draw the corresponding aldehyde or ketone from the acetal or from the hemiacetal uh, that's given to us. So let's see if we can do this. Let's draw the carbonyl and alcohols that are used to make the following acetal. So here I have this nice ring structure, right? And um, you might go, oh my gosh, what, what is this? How do, I, um, how do I even go about doing something like this? Well, if you follow a few steps, I hope it kind of makes it a little bit easier for you to to kind of work out, work on, and of course we're going to um, do you know look at some examples uh, in just a little bit. So the first thing that you have to be able to do is you have to find the acetal. Um, <clears throat> when you're first uh, looking at these problems, uh, it, it's not going to be as easy um, as you might think. Um, but hopefully I can help you out. The key to finding the acetal is to look for the carbon with two oxygens connected to it, right? Because acetals are diethers. And so you have to find the carbon that has two oxygens connected to it. And we see it's this carbon right here, right? You see that carbon has an oxygen on the left and an oxygen on the right-hand side. Okay, so the next step is that we're going to break those carbon-oxygen bonds and only those carbon-oxygen bonds. So I break here and I break here. I'm going to redraw that with the breakages. Right? So notice I've gotten rid of that um, of each carbon-oxygen bond. And um, one is still attached and the other is not. Um, so the next step is that we're going to put a carbonyl on the acet acetal carbon. So it's on the carbon that we broke those two bonds. And it's right here, and we're going to put a carbonyl there. Right, That's the carbon uh, that had the two carbon-oxygen bonds. So that's where my carbonyl is from, the aldehyde or the ketone. In this case, it's a ketone. And then the last, the fourth step, is to make the oxygens into OH groups, right, into alcohols. So I simply add a hydrogen on each oxygen, and I have now my alcohols. And I'm done, right? So I see that the acetal above is from a ketone that has an alcohol attached to it, intramolecularly, and also um, ethanol has come off of it, right? So I can make that ketone, the acetal, from an intramolecular um, uh, hemiacetal formation and then react that with ethanol 
and I get that following acetal. Okay, so let's look at uh, this particular example and see if we can determine um, where, you know, what carbonyl uh, and what alcohols uh, can make this acetal. So this is an acetal, and the first thing we have to do is determine the acetal carbon. And that carbon is with the two oxygens bonded to it, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to break those two oxygen carbon bonds. We're going to um, put a carbonyl on that carbon, and we're going to put hydrogens on the oxygens. And so we get this, right? So I get, um, I get propanol, I get another propanol, and I get my carbonyl. And um, notice on that carbon, there's only one methyl group coming off of it. So it has to be an aldehyde. And of course, we see it's acetaldehyde. So how do I make this if I want to then make the acetal? Well, basically, I take acetaldehyde and I react it with um, propanol in the presence of an acid catalyst. So you might see this in, you know, various renditions in terms of reagents. Um, the textbook likes to use uh, this where you, your reagent is a protonated prop propanol in propanol, right? And of course this is going to give you your acetal. However, you might see reagents like this. So um, this is simply, um, you know, the reagent is propanol and you're adding a catalyst uh, of an acid. So uh, th this is PTSOH. And PTSOH is a short abbreviation for paratoluene sulfonic acid. Paratoluene sulfonic acid is a, is a great organic acid to use um, when you need a catalyst. Um, and the reason for this is, is because it's a solid and so you can add just a little bit to it, of it to your reaction and it works very well. And the structure of paratoluene sulfonic acid uh, looks like this. It's a toluene derivative of a sulfonic acid, um, SO3, SO3H, right? So um, uh, we can make these from um, uh, dehydrating, well, taking a carbonyl, treating it with sodium bisulfite, and then dehydrating um, the alcohol uh, from that. So uh, fairly easy to make sulfonic acid derivatives, and we'll see them time and time again.